Well, we're heading down to the studio. Mm, uh, been a while. Yeah, <laughs> just to, just to screw around. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the show. No. The show is on the Miller Motorsports Park and the Miller Collection of Automobiles, which uh, went missing a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Larry died, and the collection was removed to, as they said, a non-disclosed location. That's never good. And we've been looking for it and trying to find out, did they sell it? What did they do with it? And people said, no, the family wasn't going to sell it, but they didn't want to keep it at the motorsports park because then they sold the motorsports park to some Chinese investors and right. isn't really being used as a motorsports park. It's all complicated and weird. Anyway, we found the cars. <laughs> and we're going to go visit the cars. They're in Boulder, Colorado, but that's not where we're going right now. We just thought in celebration of that and in celebration of the fact that we're almost finished with the blue Mustang, mm -hmm. that we would go back and pull a whole bunch of tape from years and years ago of the Miller Motorsports Park and the Miller Collection. Probably the best collection of Fords on the planet with the possible exception of the actual Ford Museum owned by the Ford Corporation. So wow. check this out, it's amazing. Ta-da! <laughs> the car. Well, our big restoration on blue is almost done. I bagged this thing back in 1980 when they were actually rather affordable. Carol Shelby was the man behind most of these cars. They were being built for Ford racing. And we are certainly not the only people who love us a good fast Ford. And Larry Miller was legendary for his love of Fords, particularly anything Carol Shelby had anything to do with. This is a 1966 Shelby GT350 Mustang. And it is just one of the many cool Fords here in Larry Miller's collection. Larry had been collecting fast Fords from the first day he could afford to buy one. Early on, Larry was just as broke as any of us, and collecting cars was really not exactly what he could afford to do. This 66 is absolutely beautiful, wearing the standard Ford racing colors, Wimbledon white and Guardsman's blue. This is a much later Shelby Mustang, a 40th anniversary Mustang, Shelby GT500 KR. And while this 64 Fairlane Thunderbolt is not a Mustang, it certainly is a fast Ford. Karen and I had visited the collection two years ago after Larry's death when the collection was sort of up in the air. Nobody knew exactly what was going to happen to it. The whole place was essentially closed down, but we found someone and they gave us the keys to the museum and said basically have fun. Toward the end of his life, Larry built this place, the Miller Motorsports Park. And yes, it was intended to be a racing venue, but I think secretly what he really had in mind was a place to keep his cars and a track to drive them on. This particular video was shot in 2009 when a bunch of us from California decided to bring our Mustangs up here and, well, ring them out a bit. A bunch of us had all bought BDX Mustangs built by the Barber Driving School and we were always looking for some sort of race to run them in. It was always fun to see what might show up at these events. Now these white Mustangs here were built by the Miller Motorsports Park, just like our cars were built by Barber. We currently have 30 of these white Mustang GTs with the blue Le Mans stripes on them. Um, we ended up with the Ford Mustang because Larry is a die-hard Ford fanatic. He loves Ford vehicles. In 2005, Larry made a cold call to the president of Ford Racing. At the time, his name was Dan Davis and Jamie Allison, who's president of Ford Performance Parts. Larry asked if they had some cars that we could use in a driving school, preferably the Mustang. And Ford invited us to Laguna Sacra in April to watch a Grand Am Cup race. Uh, that prompted a conversation between Larry Miller and Dan Davis to come up with a performance package that was 
pretty much a bolt-on conversion for the Mustang GT to enhance braking and handling performance. At the end of our first year, uh, which was about middle of October in 2006, Larry Miller called me on the phone and he says, the driving schools cars are just a blast. He says, I just wish they were a little bit faster. So we took one of our driving school cars and put it on a serious diet. We took 330 pounds of dead weight out of the interior on it and put on some uh, DOT race tires and had our chief driving instructor, Dan McKeever, who ends up our driving school here at Miller Motorsports Park, drive a driving school car and this car back to back. Uh, we used our east track, which is two and a quarter miles, and this car was seven seconds faster than our driving school car. It was within about a second and a half of our Grand Am Cup car. Uh, so I called Larry back and he commissioned us to build 12 of these challenge cars. We currently rent these cars out to racers who want to come in and experience the track and experience these cars. In April of 2007, we contacted Ford Racing and told them what we had come up with. And they liked it enough that they have commissioned us to build 75 of Ford Racing's FR500S, which is a spec race car, Ford Racing for the Miller Cup, which is a series that we're also associated with. For the first time in Ford's history, they built a purpose-built race car. Uh, the AAI people put uh, a lot of the Shelby GT500 componentry in them. The engine that's in this car is a standard 4.6 liter three valve. It is sealed. The engines have been dynoed by Roush Racing and uh, sealed by Roush Racing. And it has the Shelby GT500 six speed transmission in it and the Shelby GT500 373 track lock differential assembly in it. We built and launched this car on March 1st. We had 21 cars sold at that point in time. People came in, big uh, weekend, we had open track, the guys could get their cars out on track and test them and tune them. We currently travel around the country from mid-Ohio to uh, Atlanta to uh, Mostport, which is up in, out of, outside of Toronto, Canada, New Jersey, so we'll, we'll be around. The Miller venture here was so successful that their school became Ford Racing's high performance driving school. It's an awesome sight to see all of Larry's Mustangs in one place like this. Although, uh, let's be fair, five of these cars aren't Mustangs, they're Ford GTs. But the rest of these cars are all either Miller Mustangs or Shelby Mustangs. Now the little blue Mustang here in the lower right is the official Mustang of Larry's other fun venture, the Utah Jazz. Now the driving school cars here are really a gas and some people seem to think that my first BDX, BDX9 here, was a Miller car because well they look rather similar. But that's just because they're all wearing the official paint scheme of Ford Racing as is this incredibly rare 1965 Shelby GT350R. The R designating that this is a racing Shelby and one of the 25 surviving 1965 GT350Rs. Now while the collection is full of Mustangs, it is much better known for these cars, the Shelby Cobras. Hands down, Larry Miller had America's premier Cobra collection. Now, surprisingly, it all started with this album by the Ripcords, Hey Little Cobra. Larry had the album, fell in love with the car, and swore that someday, when he was older and richer, he would get one. And he did. He bought this one right here, back when they were a lot more affordable than they are now. Someone had already started a restoration on it and that all needed to be undone and redone. So Larry hired Dave and Bill Murray of Colorado, America's premier Cobra restorers, to fix the thing for him. Larry had bought a Toyota dealership and well he was doing pretty well so he could afford to get his dream car. 
Now, brass model builder extraordinaire Don Hendrickson had started a 1-8 scale Cobra model and he said let's run down to the Toyota dealership and see if we can convince Larry to show us his car. Now, when Larry saw the model, he just went nuts for it and sent us with one of his guys across the street to the shop where he kept the car. And we were able to pull the car out, rev it up, sit in the car, take pictures of ourselves. It was a gas. This is model builder Phil Ringwood standing with the car that day. Larry also gave us a shoebox full of photographs of the car being restored and some other photographs in there of some of his other cars and said these might help you in your research. So here we see the entire restoration of the car starting with the frame and then some of the bird cage elements getting put on there, primer paint, and the whole thing starting to go together. Aluminum bodywork. This is removing the old primer to put on the new primer. Like I say, a restoration had already been started on it. Dropping in the 427 side oiler. Then the whole car was painted Wimbledon white and then the Guardsman's Blue was painted over the top of that. And here's the same car in the collection, photographed two years ago when Karen and I were out there having fun. Now this little car was sitting right next to Larry's at the Murray Brothers shop, a British 289 Cobra, and well, Larry bought it because it was cool had them finish the restoration on it, and then drove it home from Colorado back to Utah. Now while these were Larry's first Cobras, they were not his first Shelby's. Here he is with a 1968 Shelby GT500 KR convertible. Back then you could pick up one of these cars for not that much money. I paid $3,500 for mine. Just before Larry's death, he bought the last Cobra he would ever buy. And ironically, it was the first Cobra he ever wanted. The one off the record cover. This time, it set him back $3 million. But by then, he had just about every configuration of this car ever built. And several of these cars have amazing history. Carroll Shelby had started producing these cars in 1962. He based it on the AC Ace, a car made in Bristol with a six-cylinder engine in it. This is the third one ever built and the first one built for racing. All of the cars were street legal, but some were set up for racing. This is the first one ever built, and no, it's not in the Miller Collection. This is at the Shelby Museum in Las Vegas. Larry offered Carol Shelby $25 million for the car, and Carol said, mm, no thank you. This is the very first 427 Cobra ever built, also in Las Vegas. Carol Shelby and Larry Miller became good friends and quite often took their cars together to car shows to show them off. Now Larry swore the cars were designed to be driven and routinely drove all of his Cobras. That monster has a 427 side oiler in it. All of these cars have some kind of Ford engine, either a 260 V8, 289, or the monster cars with the 427s in them. Now, Larry never forgot the fact that he came from very modest means, and one of the standard jokes is that you'd see him driving around town in these Cobras looking for a meter that still had time on it. And that's not just a joke, he actually would do that. And that brings us to the rarest Cobra in the room, this guy right here, one of the six Daytona Coupes built by Peter Brock for Ford Racing. 
The open cars had trouble with the very high speeds necessary on some of the European tracks and so they decided to enclose six of them and make them into coupes. They were built between 1964 and 65 by Shelby employee Pete Brock. Now while Pete Brock built six of these for Ford Racing, he constructed a seventh seen here for Willamette Racing. It's just like the others, only it was built onto an existing chassis. Willamette Racing was a British team and notice that this thing has right hand drive. It is the British version of the same car. Back then the Ferrari 250 GTO was pretty much king of the international racing circuit and these cars were specifically designed to knock them off the top spot and they did. Now if you want a bag of reproduction, check this one out. This is built by Kirkham Motorsport in Orem, Utah. Now Peter Brock was also told to construct a 427 version. He started on one and here it is finished, finished by the Murray brothers. So what the heck is this one? Well he actually started on two of them. Willamette Racing wanted a British version, so he started building one for them too. Neither one of those cars were ever finished until the Murray brothers finished the American version. But Larry was able to get a hold of the British version and here it is in his collection and he decided to not finish the car but just leave it exactly as it appeared the day Peter Brock walked away from it. Because the car was never finished it's really easy to see how one of these things goes together. The aluminum body is all hand formed over a wooden buck and then that is attached to the car with pop rivets connecting to steel tubes which are welded to the frame. It's really primitive when you think about it. Now they had also started building the engine, a 427 side oiler, and here it is. Now the reason these coupes were never finished is because Ford was spending millions to develop a much more sophisticated Ferrari killer. This thing, the Ford GT40. In the first few years the car performed reasonably well, winning quite a few races, but they kept dialing it in and perfecting until they came up with this one in 1967, the Mark IV. This yellow one was the first to compete at Sebring with Mario Andretti and Bruce McLaren behind the wheel and it took top honors. The Mark IV represents a complete departure in Ford GT40 design. It's really unlike all of the other GT40s and it's the only one built totally in America. This one competed later that year at Le Mans with Dan Gurney and A.J. Foyt behind the wheel and they won the race. It stands to this day the only 100% American car to win at Le Mans. American drivers, American car, American design. It's considered by many collectors to be the most desirable of all American cars. But that didn't stop Larry Miller from driving the wheels off of it every time he got the chance. As I say, Larry believed the cars were meant to be driven. All of the cars in the collection were routinely taken out on the track. The Mark IV version is noticeably different than the other Ford GT40s. And mechanically, it's utterly, utterly different. But arguably, it still stands today as America's most successful race car. Now here's an interesting car. This was one of the Mark II versions. There were so many limitations with the Mark I that they turned the whole thing over to Carroll Shelby and said, fix it. And this is what he came up with, the Mark II version. 
Number 40 here was brought back into racing in 1967 called The Mirage, and it really did quite well. And here we have a Mark I. In fact, this is the prototype, the very first Ford GT40. Mechanically, it really wasn't up to the task, but it was a proof of concept. Now, you also had to produce quite a few of these cars to get them homologated for international racing, so a street version was produced. This is a British version of the street version. Well, this was an amazing time to be screwing around. At the time, of course, we had no idea that all of this would go away quite soon. Larry died and everything kind of changed. Glenn decided to give up racing and he sold us the red Mustang here, BDX number five. We retired it having no interest at all in racing anymore. It's an amazing car, but we'd have to haul it all the way to California if we wanted to race it. And we just don't have that much interest in driving its wheels off. It's fun to just take to car shows. I'm just glad that we were able to be there when all of this was going on. It was an amazing, amazing time and space. And although the track is in limbo and the collection moved to Colorado, the Larry H. Miller dealerships do survive. This is our favorite dealership, Larry Miller's Super Ford down by the recording studio. And I do mean Super Ford. Check out the Celine. They also have this incredible Shelby GT350. This is where we bought our Ford Focus because they're just really cool people and we bring all of our repair work here because they know how to take care of a high performance Mustang. Well, Larry Miller certainly had perfected the high, high art of screwing around and how lucky for us that we were able to be part of that. And screwing around certainly proves the old adage that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Well, that was sure amazing. Oh, man. Amazing, amazing to see. What an opportunity that we had back in the day right. to be part of that. Exactly. Even if it was just to go out there and... Right, and watch the cars. and Watch the cars, go to the collection. And they were so nice about just letting us have access to right. the collection. Exactly. You, know? yeah. you wanted to sit in the Daytona, you know, you could That's arrange okay. that. Yeah. Alden had even said back in the day when he was working there, if I ever wanted to take pictures of a car, he'd be willing to haul them outside in the sunlight, whatever he wanted to do. It was nice. just... You know, it's just such nice people and so friendly about it. And right. Just absolutely, absolutely amazing people. Right. And it's gone now, yeah. but... Uh, end of an era, in a way. End of an era. It, it does drive home that rather important point that if you have an opportunity to do a thing, do a thing. Right. Uh, you may not get that opportunity to do the thing ever again. Right stuff moves on life changes the whole world Change changes every breath we take you pass up an opportunity to screw around with a thing today you may never get that opportunity to do that thing ever again so strike while the proverbial iron is hot exactly. well if you haven't been over to the channel get on over to the channel it's really cool and there's like a hundred and 70 something coming up yep. on 180 movies Not there now away. good grief yes and of course what you want to do is subscribe now if you're already a subscriber if you click on the blue button which is appearing momentarily it'll just take you to the channel but if you're not a subscriber, an amazing thing happens when you click on the blue button which is appearing just now zoink that just made you a subscriber took you to the channel and made you cool all in one little click on yes. that blue button right there. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring, and we will see you here again in one week with some more massive screwing around. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.